What is? Excuse me. Hello? Hi, John. Oh. Want me to call you back? Yeah, I'm just in the middle of an interview with a bunch of people and a video camera and God knows what else. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try to give you a call tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. I wouldn't live anywhere else. There was a spirit of cobalt, that's about all I can say. We just never wanted to leave. I go to a site and I feel like it takes me back 110 years to where these guys are doing the work right around me kind of thing. I get that feeling when I go to these places. There is a, a definite difference between uh, the city of Toronto, for instance, at three and a half million people and then the town of Cobalt at a thousand people. What we have here is our history. We have to protect our history. That is the greatest asset we have. Who knows, 100 years from now, we may be down to nothing. It's hard to say. But we have that old saying, we have that cobalt spirit. We're here till we drop. And one day we will drop. Well, I mean, um, the story that's told all around the world was that, um, you know, Fred LaRose threw the hammer at the fox and found silver. It was back in 1903 when Fred LaRose made discovery. He threw his hammer to scare away the fox. The hammer struck a silver vein. The town would never be the same again. The, old... the idea that somebody basically tripped over one of the richest silver discoveries in history, really inspired people. I mean, this, the message was, hey, if Fred LaRose could find silver, so could you. There's a story that uh, he threw a hammer at a fox and that the hammer hit silver. The true story, which I happen to believe, is that he was out in the bush relieving himself when his eye happened to see something sparkling. Fred LaRose did find silver, but he found silver because he was a prospector. When he wasn't working on the railway, he went out and he carefully checked rocks every night. He was the second to discover silver. The first were McKinley and Dara, who were ex-California gold rush prospectors. McKinley and Dara came up through here. They were looking for logs to supply as railway ties for the Temiskaming and Northern Ontario Railway. When they came to mile 103, they started noticing that the rocks had a different texture. They set them down, they got them tested a couple of different places before they found out that it was testing like at 22% silver for a ton. That's a lot. And then once the provincial geologist came up here, Willett Green Miller, he went back and he said, my God, the riches here are beyond belief. And nobody believed him. It took a few more months after, about eight or nine months through the winter, and the staking rush started. Cobalt went from a half a dozen people to like thousands, literally in six months. You know, they were handcuffing people to their train seats because prospectors were getting to the woods in Tomogamy and literally rolling out the windows to be the first ones in the bush. <laughs> Anyone could come here with a pick and a wheelbarrow and make a buck, a quick buck. People from all over the world came to Cobalt to stake claims and tried to make a fortune. Cobalt had a large population, Ukrainian, Finnish, Italian, Austrian, Bulgarian, Syrian, a Russian Jewish population. There was no plan. There was never supposed to be a town here. 
I think it was Willard Green, he, all he did was stick a signpost over by the rail, called it Cobalt, so that they could tell the train where to stop. And the name stuck. This place was one of the very early places in Cobalt. On the other side of this stack is where the first tent was here, and originally it was a church. Then they found the Silver Bay. The church was pushed aside because the mining companies at that time could do that. Citizens woke up and they had blasted up the street here because they were following the Silver Vein. Uh, there's stories of a lady working in her garden and she could hear this noise, this working down below her all of a sudden. You know, the drill bit come up almost right between your legs. Like <laughs> They drained Cobalt Lake three times to mine the silver underneath it. Over the years, I've had to draw a map of cobalt, and I thought one of them's got to be wrong because the lake kept changing shape on these maps. The province and the mines had very predatory policies about land. Basically, everyone was treated as a squatter. You could be kicked off your house. Your business could be shut down or stripped to the ground by a mining company if they thought they were in the way. So there was not a lot of incentive to build safe housing. They built houses in, in a terrific rush. The people had to do the best they could. At the same time, you had to really inspire investors to want to come here, so you had to make it look like this was this great urban center. They put up all these big buildings with big sort of fake false fronts. It was kind of like a theater set. Cobalt, it was pointed out, was built on probably the worst piece of ground in North America to build any kind of community. It didn't really start developing till the spring of 1905 and there were, you know, a number of tents and a couple of buildings and by the fall there was like a pool hall, two banks, a photographer's studio, drugstore, ice cream maker. They had a stock exchange, seven or eight live theaters here and yet you don't have clean drinking water or a proper place to, to educate children. That shows uh, some of the crazy decisions that were being made. There was open-air sewers everywhere. There was animals running through the streets. There was very few people that were bathed and showered. You know, garbage everywhere. With all these unsanitary conditions that, we, that you had here, um, things like natural disasters happened all the time. In 1909, there was a huge fire that destroyed almost the entire town. People then were placed in camps, tent camps, living without clean water, extreme unsanitary situations, extremely close and packed in together. It was, wasn't long before a typhoid epidemic, the largest it had been known to date, took place. And there was very little by way of medical support for the community. There was two or three doctors. There was a tiny hospital, but it only had 13 beds in it. So a call went out for nurses to come in from all the major centers in Ontario and even in Buffalo. Injuries back then were extremely common. Uh, deaths, uh, you know, were, were very, very typical things to happen. There was no safety clothing. They didn't wear hard hats. I don't think they had hard boots. Originally, it was just a guy holding a spike. And, uh, and his partner holding his sledgehammer, and he hit the, the steel, and you would twist it and hit it and twist it. Very backbreaking manual labor. The ore was taken out of the mines up on the Colonial Hill, transported by buckets across town, right across the lake up onto the eastern slopes, and that's where the mill was, and that's where the ore was processed. There was a few people who got a ding on the head because the rocks falling out of the buckets. They, they came here and they were mining, but they, they were learning all the time as they worked at it. A lot of the early mining legislation was based on the experiences of cobalt. To understand cobalt, you have to recognize that it may be on the map in Ontario. It has nothing to do with Ontario. It is like a cultural meteorite that crash lands in the middle of central Canada. 
Its roots are in the western United States, in the gold rush camps and copper mining towns of Boise, Idaho, Butte, Montana, Goldfields, Nevada. So when cobalt was first opened up, it was prospectors and mining men who were coming in from the American West. And in the American West, the war between the miners and the capitalists was actually fought out with guns in the army. Cobalt was an incredibly predatory, chaotic, uh, unsafe community where enormous profits were being made and they were being made literally with the lives of the miners and their families. The Cobalt Miners Union first appears in the tents and in the bunkhouses in like 1905, 1906. 1907, there's the first general strike. And it's probably one of the most radical strikes ever that we've seen in the history of Ontario because you're bringing in much more of a radical worldview on owner-worker relations. The Wobblies, the famous IWW are in Cobalt. Another person who came through Cobalt was Big Jim McGuire. He launched the 1907 general strike in Cobalt. Jim McGuire really believed that if workers stayed together, they could build a better world. It has been said that one of the reasons we have the Workers' Compensation Act in Ontario today is a direct result of the leadership that Big Jim McGuire and the Cobalt Miners Union showed in fighting for workers who were being injured on the job. And, you know, a hundred years later, that legislation is still an important piece of the protection that workers count on in Ontario and in Canada. In the building that we're actually standing in right now, the, uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange was born here, uh, upstairs, uh, right next to an explosives factory. <laughs> One of the first OPP stations north of Toronto was here. What actually was seen from uh, what was mined here, you've got virtually all of Young Street in Toronto was built on cobalt money. Wall Street in New York, all of those big financial industrial centers were made with cobalt money. The forerunner to the NHL that we know today was created in part by Ambrose O'Brien, who was involved with the O'Brien mine here in Cobalt. Uh, the money and uh, funds, part of those proceeds, went to develop what's called the National Hockey Association. They had several teams, uh, including the Cobalt Silver Kings, and the first game that they ever played was against the Montreal Canadiens. They lost in overtime to the Montreal Canadiens. And yeah, we lost <laughs> against the Canadiens, but we won the, uh, the second game, so we had an away and, and home series, so. So some of the more notable people that visited the area would be the Prince of Wales came here. We had several Prime Ministers come here, including Wilfrid Laurier. Thomas Edison uh, actually had his own mine here. He was interested in making battery power. He's one of the pioneers of the cobalt industry that we know today. Uh, Sir Henry Pellet, with his company called the Mining Corporation of Canada, they drained the lake, emptied it all out, and they literally just exploited the whole thing. He took all of his fame and fortune and sunk it into what is known as Casa Loma. But yeah, this place made a lot of people rich. <laughs> the original discoveries of silver and cobalt drove a massive stock boom, not in Toronto, but in New York. And the amount of money that was being generated through the stock boom at cobalt was unprecedented, upwards of what was then a billion dollars in capitalization. A lot of that stock was fraud. A lot of the mining properties that were being sold all around the world had nothing to do with mining. But there was so much money being made in speculation in cobalt that it launched Canada as a worldwide leader in resource development. And it turned Toronto from a sleepy backwater into the worldwide center of mining capital investment. And it's still the worldwide center of mining capital investment. So when they talk about cobalt being the cradle Canadian mining, it's because the money that was made here in the mines pushed the prospecting boom to Larder Lake, to the discoveries in Rouen Naranda, to Val d'Or, to Kirkland Lake, to Timmins. 
There's not much here left other than holes in the ground, a lot of broken rock and some memories, but the influence of this mining community was extraordinary. So you have people like uh, the Timmins brothers that were part owners of the, uh, the La Rose mine. And they took uh, all of their money and their investment and they explored further north of here and discovered obviously the, the town of Timmins. Gold mining is in a total different league of its own. Silver is poor man's gold. So it took a lot of the expertise out of the area and partially contributed to the end of the first boom of the cobalt area. You see the starting of the Timmins camp in 1909, uh, basically when cobalt's at its peak. Uh, and of course, Timmins starts to take off in Kirkland Lake in the, you know, the early 1920s as cobalt was declining. Excuse me. Hello. Yeah. L look, dear, I'm awfully busy. I'll call you back later. I'll call you back later. Okay, dear. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. That's my sister in the nursing home. She's a year older than me. And <laughs> we keep in touch. You were referring to the second boom as the beginning of the Silver Miller Mines. That was uh, my father. He was a very inquisitive man that wanted answers to various things. And he felt sure there must be another pocket of silver in the area. And he made up his mind that a certain area looked to him to be promising. And then he did a terrific amount of back and forth to t Toronto and other cities to get backing to be able to dewater an existing mine. First thing we knew, he was finding silver and started off with the, uh, the first mine. And from there, it was such a rich one that they were able to build the mill, which was the first mill built in the area since the early ones had closed. Harry Miller was out exploring. He felt that there was still more silver to be found, and he found it. Also at the same time, the 1950s was uh, post-World War II, and the mineral cobalt this time was being exploited. They realized in the atomic age, cobalt had a strengthening ability to it. It would make steel harder, uh, so it was able to make armor penetrating ammunition, that kind of thing. Uh, and then they also realized that when cobalt was superheated, it had radioactive properties. So uh, this mineral that had been tossed aside for years and years and was just seen as this nuisance material suddenly became of interest again. And so in the 50s, you see all these mines starting to reopen and people coming and cleaning up the dumps and cleaning up the tailings and looking for cobalt as opposed to silver. Silver was just sort of a payoff. Well, I was, uh, I landed in Toronto in 1948. I immigrated from England. Well, I was just getting going when I came to Cobalt in 1951. There was Harry Miller, then there was a company called Solanco. They had a whole bunch of mines, and there were two or three other mines. The town was extremely busy. There were several hundred people working in the mines. No, I feel I took to it like a duck takes to water. It was a fascinating, exciting town. And this town was full of characters, interesting characters. There were a lot of high graders too. They were the people who stole silver. One or two of them were unmitigated, the very unpleasant crooks, and several of them were very nice people. They just didn't believe that the mine should have all the silver, so they helped themselves to it. They used to load the trunk of the car with silver and put wedges in the springs so that the car didn't appear to be loaded. It was exciting times because Lord Alexander came after the mill opened. As Mum always said from being a clippy on the buses in London during the war, 
Here she was entertaining Lord Alexander and Princess Alice. I was very fortunate to be my father's daughter because I was proud of everything that he did and the way that he put a good 20 years of um, good living back into the town. I've been always very, very proud of both my father and my mother. Most of those mines that operated in the second boom were on like the, the southwest portion of town. Um, and after that, in, in the 60s and 70s, uh, you come into the uh, Cobalt Consolidated era. They eventually culled the entire amount of mining here in the Cobalt area down to one producing company called Agnica Legal Mines. But the Cobalt camp was already on its decline from basically the, the, the early 60s. When the fire happened in 77, it, it just put a major nail in the coffin. There was an old building being torn down, and there was this young fellow working with his father, and he broke his hammer or did something stupid. His father was very mad with him, so the kid went and sat inside the building, smoked a cigarette, and threw it into a pile of trash. That's how the fire started. We lost 105 homes and five businesses, all in the course of a few hours. 77? Yeah, I remember it very well. I don't remember it very well. I was one of the ones that was accused of that goddamn thing. I was the only kid that was accused of that. Because we used to play in the old building, right? Yeah, I can tell you a hell of a lot about that one. Because I was one of the people that lost my house. Fireman knocked on my door and said, Al, he says, get your vehicle and yourself off the street because the wind is carrying the fire 40 feet across and it's gonna take out the whole street. We didn't have a chance to take a thing out. Jumped into the vehicle. We're going down to the crest of the hill in the side view mirrors. You could see the flames going. And as it hit the houses, boom, within seconds, it just blew up because of the intense heat. And then, the tar paper was flying with the wind, secondary fires down in Frenchtown. And a lot of my friends, they lost their houses down there. But that was a terrible thing that day. It was awful. It was really an awful fire and that was my I remember it so well because that was the day I moved in up here yeah that, the fire of 77 would have probably been one of the one of the definite defining moments that killed the area here after that fire it kind of ripped the, the heart of the community out uh, um, uh, at not only economically but you know, it, it, it hurt deep down into a core of our culture here. And then a few years later with the cave-in on Highway 11. If you go down that street, there's that old mine shaft standing by an open cut. And a little way away from that, the highway collapsed some years ago. We called it the world's biggest pothole, I think. I worked for David Ramsey for a brief period down in Toronto, and they they were that close to moving the town after that cave-in. And it came down to basically about a 10 or $15 million difference of moving the town or upgrading the town. And so they chose to upgrade the town. The cobalt, and cobalt was just more or less recovering after a fashion from that when mining stopped. Silver prices collapsed in the late 80s. Uh, we shut down our operations. We had almost 300 workers working for Agnico at that time. Uh, there was other exploration efforts and other small groups working in the area. They all shut down. But it also coincided a worldwide recession, which happened in 1991. The last silver mine closed in 1990, and the Sherman mine at Tomogamy closed in 1990 also. 
and the Sherman mine had employed a lot of cobalt people. It basically left this place without a, without a trade anymore. The population declined quite quickly after that. And as a result of all this, the grocery stores and all the, all the businesses uh, leaving cobalt, people had to go elsewhere to find work. Schools closed down and they had to close it down because you were down to 40 kids and it was too costly to keep the schools open. Because of the, the cascading issues, the fire, the cave-in, rebuilding in the town, the devastating effect of the 91 recession, closing down the mines, it's amazing that we even have 1,200 people in this town. I'm gonna I'm gonna open one next year. So basically our town right now is a good retirement area and it's a peaceful place to live. And I've been here all my life and I'm gonna stay here until I I die. I don't know. I guess there are a lot of people like myself that uh, came here in good times and bought a house or they hang on. And there's a lot of people have moved in simply because they can buy a cheap house and they just leave their families here and commute. Statistically speaking, cobalt shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have survived this. Most mining towns close up their doors when the industry is done and, and they move on. I think the people of the area here are what to keep it. There's a pride of being a cobalter. So you still have a lot of generational families that are staying in the area here and surviving despite the odds. Hey! Bye, Cody. Bye. The effects of mining today are still quite seen. Draining the lake uh, and then subsequently filling it full of tailings and waste and whatnot, those are all still very visible and things that are not erased from the countryside today. In fact, the ball diamond is made of slimes. That's what you're playing on down there. And you'll note all around Cobalt, there's different areas, tailings ponds. Cart Lake is used to be a lake, but now it's basically just a, a large receiving area for the fine ground up uh, tailings. And of course, there's concerns about the arsenic being in the, in the waterways, and people are working still today to monitor that and to remediate that. There are still quite a bit of hazards in the area here. They were filling up uh, a hole on Nipissing Hill the other day uh, to make it safe. And they dumped $50,000 worth of concrete into this hole. And two minutes later, the operator looked down and all the concrete just, <laughs> just disappeared into another hole. <laughs> There's you know, people getting chunks of their land, getting fenced off due to mining hazards. An entire house was swallowed into a sinkhole up on Galena. With time, all of this stuff is going to start collapsing and degrading. I remember we were in the mine, the big pits in the middle of the town, and we threw a rock. We did not hear it hit anything. And I just thought, oh my god, you could so disappear here. And I think somebody said, oh, you, everybody has to tell a loved one that they're going for a hike in Cobalt. And I loved that idea that it was like, always dangerous. Right? There was always this precarious sensibility in cobalt, just naturally, and everyone was fine with that. There's probably mine workers underneath this house, but I don't worry about them. 
we would get candy at the store and we would trade candy so you could jump across the widest part of the open cuts. According to a, a friend who's been dead a long time ago, Mr. Verboni, he used to walk from the Colonial through the drift right to the southern end of the town and come up at the town site, walk across the road, go into his home, have his lunch, go back to the town site, down underground, all the way back to the Colonial and resume his afternoon shift. You know when you're downtown, just across from the Fraser House, there's a, a, a mine head frame and a, what, and a store at the basement of it. I think it's a bookstore now. That was a grocery store. My wife told me stories about walking through this adit and into the underground workings and coming up at the grocery store. The grocer used to lower his meat and vegetables down the mine shaft where it was cool to keep them fresh. When they went to go fill in the shaft in 2015, they hung a light and a camera and they, they sent it down the shaft to see what they were dealing with. And it went down and down and down and down and they're all looking very important and they're watching everything on the laptop and they all froze. And one guy after about three or four seconds says, are those bones? Well, there's a butcher here for like 40 years. Where are you gonna throw bones, honestly? And no, you're not going down the shaft anymore. I had it, all kinds of people every summer. They always asked me if they can go down there. I've been offered money to let people go down there. First of all, it's not my building. Second of all, I don't even want to dream of the liabilities. There were several kids that found a big box of dynamite underground still. They just walked home with it and the kid brought it in. Hey mom, look what I got. And she's looking at this literally a 50 pound box of foresight. Uh, no blasting caps in it and all of the nitroglycerin had leaked out of it, but it, it was definitely a good excuse to call the bomb squad out. <laughs> So many people said to us, yeah, we went out hiking and then I realized, oh, if I'd taken two more steps, I would have died. And they all laugh and they're like all casual, but it was just something that they did. So I loved, I loved that edginess of the people. I pretty much, uh, when I have spare time, I hop on my bike and I just go around and uh, explore the mine sites and abandoned ruins from the mill sites. Growing up, it was basically like my backyard. It was everyone's backyards around here. Everything's waste rock everywhere and there's mine shafts in people's backyards for real. So about 21 years ago, give or take, I was at the Cola Public School. There's a group of my friends that went to the Coneagas mine site. And they went up to the top of the one shaft and they started tossing rocks down like normal. That was a normal thing we'd always do. And I guess he found a pretty good sized rock that he had to dig a little bit out around to get it loose. And when it broke loose, it slid out from under him and landslided him right down the shaft. Basically what saved him from what I remember of the story is there's some water in the bottom of the shaft. His arm was so mangled up and it caught around a rock that basically just kept his head above water. He would have drowned because he couldn't move anything because he was totally broken up and in shock and stuff. But he stayed conscious. He was in the shaft for hours. It took way longer than we felt like it should have, but we were panicking and teenagers, right? So I'm sure they did as good of a job as they could, the rescuers, but to us, it seemed like it was way too long. Like we basically, we thought our friend was gonna die. We were sure of it. That kept me out of the mines for 17 years about, and it's just been recently, like the last about five years now that I've come to terms with it. I decided I'm gonna basically learn how I can go about checking out the cool sites and everything safely. Like for myself, I'm super careful. I look at everything around. And if I'm going underground anywhere, if there's any loose cracked rocks that could fall on me, I just don't go. Because I don't want to get hurt. 
but I also don't want to have a boring life in an awesome place where I can go out and have the best adventures anyone can really have in my opinion, right in my own backyard. Oh man, like this stuff is insane. I go to, the, to a site and I feel like it takes me back 110 years to where these guys are doing the work right around me kind of thing. I get that feeling when I go to these places. Most people walk by and they're like, well, it's a big hole. That's pretty freaking nuts. <laughs> Cobalt's very unique. We are a National Historic Site. The Cobalt National Historic Site didn't start just overnight. It, it began in the, in the early 70s. They were trying to look at ways and means to protect uh, some of the history of the Cobalt Camp. The head frames, the old mining structures, and then it morphed into historic buildings. They had all these small components, but nothing really jived to put it all together under one one roof and so when I got on council in 97 we finally convinced council that we should maybe look at it from the national perspective. We had to go through a few hoops and eventually we did the application and were successful and we had it done before the 2003 100th anniversary celebrations uh, as a National Historic Site. What's interesting about it is it's a self-sustaining historic site. We do not get any money from the national government and it's actually quite a crying shame that they really put out almost nothing. Lots of people like to come to do the self-guided tour, which is the Heritage Silver Trail. And slowly over the years, the sites are getting shut down. So it's less enticing for people to come from out of town here. It, it's sad to say, but in the last 12, 14 years, the town has lost its way because you're not, you're not getting there. You don't see the, the light at the end of the tunnel in this project. Meanwhile, a lot of those sites have now gone to waste. Some have been removed, some because of hazards, some because the, the problem with wooden head frames is that they rot. It's a sad day, guys. That's the Nipissing 73 head frame. You know how sad that is? You used to be able to see it from everywhere up there. Now, I've seen a bunch of write-ups right when the Silver Trail was done of people that came and seen it and super happy, tons of pictures, the best write-ups ever. And then just a few years later, the same people come back and then they have another write-up from their visit to Cobalt. And they're basically saying how sad it is, the state of some of the sites. Well, I think, uh, you know, Cobalt is a great place and I love going there, but you know, like I have to be honest, like when we, when we first started going there in the mid knots, like around 2005 or 2006, there were a lot more head frames from the old mines standing there then than there are now. So you see that, you know, those kind of heritage aspects of the community disappearing. And uh, Cobalt has based a lot of its tourism and a lot of its promotion of itself to the outside world based on this bright time in their past. I, I don't know how much time you could spend in continuing to keep head frames sitting around that are like 100 years old. The right of way mine at the north end of Cobalt is one of the oldest uh, still standing mine structures in the Cobalt Mine Camp. And uh, we, the Cobalt Historical Society, consider it our icon. And anyone that comes to the town will see it and probably take home a picture of it. 
We've put about $100,000 worth of renovations inside the building and now that's at risk because the metal roof is rusted so now we're looking to replace the roof on the head frame to preserve the structure. And so we're doing a fundraising campaign for that and we're about a third of the way there. We need to raise about $35,000. The community does respond uh, positively for us. They help where they can. Right now, we're making targeted mailing campaigns to people that we know are friends of Cobalt. We don't want to exhaust uh, our, our donors, and uh, we're just hoping that um, uh, with time that we'll be able to gather the money that we need. So it's badly needed here, and hopefully uh, someone runs with it uh, on council and, and the region recognizes this. It's not like we're not nationally recognized, we got it. It's already in place. Unfortunately, uh, uh, it is what it is and we are where we are today. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, all we have is our history. It's not exactly my forte or anything, but it did seem to me that there were some problems there with some drug use in, this, in the town. And, you know, there were some kind of sad aspects of Cobalt too, because the, the place was a place that its glory days was like 100 years ago. In the completed electric vehicle, the batteries, electrically isolated from the chassis, are contained in a T-shaped metal tray. This tray can be unbolted and lowered from the car to gain access to the batteries. This design was chosen as the best solution. Offering lightweight, crashworthiness, and minimal impact on passenger seating comfort. Around 215, 216, there was a renewed interest in the Cobalt Camp. First, it started with uh, silver and base metal gold uh, with companies like TriOrigin and Brixton. But right around the Early part of 2016, there was a big move in the battery market for electric vehicles. According to what you read in here, they're looking for cobalt. Cobalt was regarded as a nuisance. It was found in association with silver. Now there's this big rush on for cobalt to uh, make batteries for electric cars. In the modern electric age, everything is powered by lithium polymer batteries. And the polymer in the lithium polymer batteries is cobalt, or at least in some instances like 80, 90% cobalt. So with this boom in technology, there's a, a need for cobalt in the world. And most cobalt is being mined unethically in places like Africa and China. So there's a big interest and a big drive to find ethical sources of cobalt uh, for battery power in the near future. And that's what's bringing people back here. Groups like Tesla that produce electric cars, they've had a huge interest in the area and they've partnered with groups like First Cobalt uh, that are trying to make battery grade cobalt. First Cobalt as the primary player in the area they're looking at retooling the former Cobatech refinery. Hopefully that refinery will take off. And what's the neat thing about the refinery is it's not based on cobalt product coming from the cobalt area. So it, it has a very strong future because it will be based on product coming from outside the region. The refineries uh, by very nature last a long time. They don't run out. Uh, I think that bodes well for the future. There was actually a staking and expiration boom that occurred from the middle of 216 that ended at the middle part of 218. Unfortunately, the cobalt boom for expiration uh, busted, uh, culminated in the price drop from $43 a pound in late part of 217, and it fell within a year, it, it went down as low as $13.5 US a pound. Yet the bust has happened because the price and the, the, it was overhyped and believe it or not, the electric vehicles have not became mainstay, but the genie's out of the bottle, it's going to occur. So there is a promising future for cobalt, it's just not going to happen right now. It's the way of the future, it will be sustainable and it makes sense. 
The other thing that's happened, which is kind of real news that's occurring as we speak here in 219, is that there's a resurgence in interest in diamonds. So one of the big players in the world, which is De Beers, no longer is mining up in Attawapiskat, and now they're focusing a lot of their efforts in this region. Diamond exploration is so serious right now. There is kimberlites here to source rock for, for diamonds. The economics of this area bodes very well for diamond exploration and mining. Private land makes this area a go-to area for renewed exploration and mining. So I'm very confident that there will be a diamond mine here in the next 10 to 15 years, maybe earlier. What Cobalt and Coleman and the Tritown area needs, needs to expand uh, and allow for more development to occur <clears throat> or they can't uh, increase its population. It's the quickest way to economic development, no question, is a, is a new mine and that would change things radically. The more work we get, the better. And Lord knows there's a lot of cobalt ore in the area. Personally, I think it would be another boost for the town. And I, I, I don't see why it wouldn't work. I think it'd be wonderful. Well, I, I'd like to see new mining develop here, but I haven't heard of anything being successful. But someday, maybe, they'll find something. It's hard to say. But I'll be long gone and dead by then, I would assume, anyways. Oh, well, now you're talking to somebody who's lived with a prospector for 40 years, okay? If they start mining, I'll believe it when I see it. I've seen way too many stock scams and God knows what going on over the years. I, I think it's just uh, stuck people to spend a little bit of money as gold is. There's definitely stuff here. There's no doubt. There's stuff here. So I'm not putting any faith in it right now. Because a lot of these fly by night companies that come in here, come here and here, they take your freaking money, they get their investment money, and next thing you know, they're gone. For myself, being all about the heritage and history. I wouldn't mind if they did open another mine and start mining for cobalt because it just adds to our heritage and history. As long as it doesn't go overboard and take out the historical sites that make cobalt really what it is. Because if, let's say they blasted it everywhere, bought out everywhere, blasted it all apart. It's basically wiped off the map at that point. And then it's just a story in a book. What kind of mine is it going to be? Is it going to be an underground mine? Are we going to see all kinds of stuff? You know, where is the tailings from all this stuff going? Is it going to be an open pit? There's two schools of thought in the cobalt area now. There's the mining, the industrial, old school way of thinking in ways to keep the town going. And then the other way is with the tourism. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next 10 years here. If they can get mining going again, obviously this place was born and raised on mining. So that's what uh, these people know. Whether or not that's going to be a, a good long-term solution to the town of Cobalt though, uh, that I, I don't, I'm not too sure. The mining returning to this area would probably lead to, you know, five to ten years worth of, of solid work, I would imagine. So five years of, of, of exploitation of the area, you got good jobs for five, ten years, and then what? Then when it's gone, you're going to close it all back up again and move on to somewhere else. Is that is that going to be more of a detriment to cobalt? Do you think? I don't know. I'm I'm trying to be like real and saying like I don't know, man. I I think that it could be dangerous. You know, like it could actually lead to a total bust of the area, right? Because you're going to get rid of a lot of the things that are keeping it going now, right? The tourism, the history, um, a lot of the stuff that was so important to us then is could potentially be gone if they open pit it. Yeah, Nipissing Hill would be gone. The open pit would probably stretch from Sass Lake to Peterson Lake, that would be the area. I'm not sure that, that mining here again is the answer. Not that I'm anti-mining, don't get me wrong. <laughs> when you talk about like mining today, it, you know, it's a, it's a tricky business. There are still a lot of problems with mining operations. And I mean, even in cobalt today, the, the soil around the school is still re monitored regularly for arsenic. 
I'm not an anti-mining person. I just think it needs to be done in a way, like not just dump a whole bunch of environmental problematic costs on the people who are left behind when they pull out. Because inevitably all these things have a lifespan and then that's it. Well, anybody who says that we should open pit this town is only looking to make a buck and leave town. That would be the dumbest thing we could ever do. What we have here is our history. We have to protect our history. That is the greatest asset we have. One of the things that really strikes me about Cobalters, uh, we have taken so many kicks over the years economically, we have seen so much heartache and so much loss, but people hold to their history. They hold to the memory of this place and they're very faithful to it. So we should protect that memory from anybody who suggests we're gonna do open pit mining. Uh, I don't think so. Will there be other mines open? Possibly. Uh, there is still cobalt here in the hills of cobalt. If it's going to happen, it's got to be done right. It's got to be done with a recognition of the damage that was done by the mines in the past to the lakes and to the ecosystem here. I don't think you'll ever see the mines return the way they did. The difference, there's a big difference today. Mines don't build towns. They fly their, their people in and keep them there for a couple of weeks and then take them out for a week and that's the way they operate. There's a possibility that if somebody started to mine around here, they'd employ some people from Cobalt, but the ch chances are there are not many miners who know mining left in Cobalt. I'm sorry to be so gloomy, but uh, I just don't believe much of the uh, stuff that's talked about cobalt. I had to give a talk recently to a group of people and I didn't know what else to do so I made a uh, walking tour of cobalt as I first saw it in 1951. And I must have come up with 50, 50 names of businesses and places of interest and it took me so long, I was close, probably closer to 75 or 100. My town had everything. You could buy your clothes here, buy your appliances here, buy your furniture here, buy anything you wanted here. There were three national car agencies here. And everything's gone. I just hope, I'm pretty old now, I'm 94, and I don't suppose I'll live long enough to see it get much better or much worse. But it's been a sad experience, but uh, a very interesting one. So I, my business is Poor Boy Souls, uh, bespoke shoe company, and my partner and I own it, and we are boot makers, and we run a repair shop as well. So heavy repairs, but uh, we make made-to-measure boots, bags, leather goods. Boot making, leather working in general is a very old trade. I found it very fitting to be a boot maker and leather worker in one of the oldest, most economically historic towns in Ontario, and to be applying my trade in one of the oldest buildings in Cobalt. This was the original Bank of Commerce building, and an estimated 80% of the commerce that built downtown Toronto uh, went through our, our safe that's still there today. At first it was very difficult. Um, people are very hesitant to trust. We're from the city, and it sounds rather cliche, but there is a, a definite difference between uh, the city of Toronto, for instance, at three and a half million people, and then the town of Cobalt at a thousand people. Businesses 
have a tendency to pop up and fade away rather quick around here just because of the landscape, the economic landscape, and people are hesitant to come in and deal with you on a regular basis until you've proved yourself of sorts. We originally started in the basement of a general store, or a craft store, because we didn't know what this business would do and it quickly morphed into a six day a week, uh, eight to ten hour a day operation. Moved out of our small shop space and actually purchased the building that we're in now uh, and that comes from a lot of community support. Whether it's uh, monetarily people supporting the business through those means or just support in general, referrals or um, even moving. Well, the, the day we moved from our small shop space to the new space, we had people coming out of their homes and willing to grab a box or some equipment and walk it from one building to the other to give us a hand. If you're looking for help with anything, you, all you have to do is walk out in the street and just holler at whoever's going by. Seriously. Never, ever been turned down. They've got a great heart here, they're great people. And I've moved 30 times in my life and Cobalt has been the most easily integrated into place that I've ever lived. Over the two years that I've been in the town of Cobalt, I've, I've recognized uh, that there's been significant growth, both economically through small businesses popping up and giving it a shot. And we are also seeing an influx of young families and that is going to contribute very well to the growth of Cobalt those young families uh, for years had a tendency to move out of town for work where we're finding now that they're coming to the area because of affordability and just the overall beauty of the area itself. Once you're here and you recognize how special of a place Cobalt is, it's a real, real sales point for, for a young family. When I came here five years ago, there were five empty stores here on the main street. There's none now and there hasn't been for most of the five years they've been here. And people are getting to figure out that there's some really neat stuff here on Cobalt. We rebuilt the live theatre and that's had an enormous impact. The classic theatre was the beginning of the revival, I presume, of, of Cobalt because we didn't have anything really to draw people here except old shafts or something, a little bit of history. You know, it really invigorated a lot of the spirit of the town again. Uh, they, you know, a lot of community effort went into putting that place back together, and it's still a big part of Cobalt today. This kind of theater here, I get the sense it's more of a, a community kind of thing. It's somewhere where the public gets together, all the locals, you know, and they experience a lot of cool stuff together. You meet a lot of friends when you went to the theater. I think Cobalt is like a lot of northern Ontario towns in that there's enormous potential to thrive. There's a new generation out there that's doing things very differently in that they, they love local and they, they want to make local work. I think communities like Cobalt who are very unique and unusual, I could latch on to that, but it really does mean that they have to start thinking differently about what their industry is going to be. It may not be mining. You have to reinvent yourself in life, you have to. Towns have to do the same thing. Our plan, long-term plan, is to stay in the town of Cobalt. Since we've moved here, we're, uh, we've had a child. We have a one-year-old daughter, and we have a baby on the way any day and we found that Cobalt is the best place to, to bring them up. It's a great small community, very, very supportive. This place does not want to die. The people here are unique that way. Because we're Cobalt people. I think Cobalt as a town will last as long as there's a few of us still living. Because it's home. I don't think anybody loses that feeling.
it was back in 1903 when Fred Rose made discovery. He threw his hammer to scare away the pot. The hammer struck a silver vein. The town would never be the same again. As the old story goes, money's pot. People came from miles around to find a job and settle down, not knowing what lay in the rough. They worked their fingers to the bone It's where these men were made of stone These mining men could never get enough I'm talking about cobalt And if you don't live there, it's your fault Where all the silver comes from You live a life and then some I'm talking about cobalt don't live there, it's your fault. We love you, Cobalt. You're the best for town I know. Come to the end of this song I'd like to thank Norm Sheriff and Jim Armstrong They tried so hard to keep our town alive Even though our silver's gone The legend still lives on and on No matter what, Cobalt will survive I'm talking about Cobalt and If you don't live there, it's your fault Where all the silver comes from You'll live a life and then some I'm talking about cobalt And if you don't live there, it's your fault We love you, cobalt You're the best for town I know We love you, cobalt You're the best for town I know